So hi everyone, I'm here with uh, Trent McKendrick today. He's the CEO of Arrears and Arrears are in the uh, digital collection space, primarily in the US. So Trent, thanks very much for, for joining me. I really thanks appreciate it. Thanks for having me, Chris. Um, so we were just chatting a little bit before beforehand, a little bit about digital collections and like we've obviously seen that grow quite significantly in the UK at least anyway I know you were in Australia for a while and now you're in the, launching in the US just in terms of like status to development around digital collections between the different markets at least that you've seen yeah 10 years ago in Australia we, we really thought that uh, digital collections would be up and going in six months and it would be yeah. you know na nationally adopted it was a struggle to get people to understand that there was a way to provide a digital payment link for people to make payments online, for people not just to have to send in a receipt or a check. Ten years ago, it was for me, it was like, how can we create a better experience for the debtor? And mm. by creating a better experience for the debtor, you're going to have a higher engagement rate. You're going to have a better outcome for your creditors or your collectors and creating a better experience across the industry. So... That was really a, a, a focus there. And I think that we're at the point now, and since moving to the US a year and a half ago to focus on building arrears, we're really seeing that collection agencies, and we were just at the ACA, the American Collection Association event in Chicago. Mm -hmm. One of the themes around that was how do you interact with debtors? How do you treat them like consumers with goals, like people that are just trying to get through life that will mm. make a payment if their circumstances are right. There are that subset, very small set of people that manipulate the system and play a game, but there are also a large chunk of people that do want to be in society and have good credit and interact well with people and not just avoid their debts. Some people go through unfortunate circumstances and they end up in positions where they owe a few thousand dollars to a, a creditor, which then goes off to a collector and then that goes through the workflow. It's in a very uncomfortable position for everybody. My feeling, and back to your question, is that digital collections are going to be more widely adopted as, across mm -hmm. the US. And I know in Australia, it's been it's basically the, the standard. You have three or four players now out of Australia, some servicing direct collections, just leveraging digital technologies, and then some just actually providing software. And so I, I, I think that the next three to five years, we're going to see a, a massive adoption globally across, yeah. across the collections industry. What do you think has been the, the holdup in terms of some of the adoption in, in North America in particular? There's a slightly different technology in things like SMSs, the way the, the way the cell phone technology kind of works, who pays for what. And I know that sort of generated sort of different levels of adoptions and different speeds of adoption. Yeah. Certainly talking with, when I talk with people in, uh, in North America, there's definitely, there's a preference towards phone and use of the dialer and some of the, the, the things that we're more used to here. And there's been legislation changes uh, in the UK that have prohibited that and maybe have moved things across. What's the catalyst that sort of, generates the digital adoption, do you think? It's a new generation of credit consumers. Mm. You're going into a world where baby boomers are no longer consuming credit. They're going through the retirement stages. Mm. Um, you have now millennials, people my age, that are, are, are the major credit consumer. And they're the mm. ones that people for the first five, 10 years of their professional career probably don't get those issues. They don't have families. They don't have family members to support. They don't have mm. those sort of general things that adults have felt throughout their lives. As millennials become adults and mature adults with families or doing different things and spending credit cards, like we're seeing the highest mm. <laughs> credit card balances yeah, uh, ever that. in the US yeah. now after the highest rate of savings, the, the flow of money and the way that the, the, the economy is working is really that the, the millennials are the up and coming credit consumers and millennials don't want to talk to people. Uh, behind the screen, they like to negotiate with their thumbs. And, and that's really where we've seen the adoption go from 10 years ago, where it was like, oh, we, we're not that interested to companies like, okay, we need to start adopting yeah. this. We need to start filling out how this can be implemented into our business, what this automation side means, what this digital side means. And, and we get a lot of, we have over a hundred people that have signed up to our platform. We get one or two turning on a week. And really mm. what it is, it's that, okay, let me understand this before I implement this into my business because it is going to be long term. Yeah. Um, what the millennials and what Gen Z's are expecting is that direct digital side of communication. Nobody wants to pick up the phone. I don't generally 
pick up the phone during business hours and in, unless it's a scheduled call. And a lot of people have jobs. Mm. The digital side also complements the fact that you can do things in your own time as uh, under a self-service type of yeah. um, operation, uh, self-service offer. And, and, and I suppose certainly as you travel around the world, then you see the same behavior. We all exhibit the same behavior as, as humans, right? We're all on we're all on our phones. I'm looking for my phone here. We're all on our phones. We're all looking on social media or on messaging apps or on those kind of things. And so like that, that almost like is, seems like that's common but it's interesting how you have different stages of development in terms of certainly in terms of financial services, in terms of this digital adoption, where there's maybe more resistance in one place or more sort of bias towards telephones versus others. Well, it, I've always seen it, Chris. So when I started the Australian <laughs> business, I was in the hmm. US, I was traveling with family and I was up hmm. late at night watching payday lending go from hmm. bricks and mortar to television on a web, you go to this website, hmm. borrow up to thousand dollars. And I was like, wow, you can, go to a website now and borrow money. I wanted to understand more about how you get money off the internet and borrow money off the internet. So it was a really a, a trial and error situation where we looked at payday lending as a, as a buying traditional businesses and turning them online. But what we really discovered is the area where we're probably going to be able to be ahead of the curve is in collections because mm. credit um, consumption is digitalized, but credit rate repayment is not and mm. or recovery is not. And that's 10 years ago, that was the view. And now it's, okay, I, I think that I thought it would take less, but I think now we're really in that three to five year, in the next three to five years, it's going to be globally adopted that everything is done via the screen. It's either a digital communication or a uh, negotiation whilst using a, a, a mobile interface or even an app. Some yeah. collectors allow you to download apps and manage multiple files. But yeah, the, yeah. So, so I am seeing what you're seeing. Definitely. And I, and I suppose, do you, do you see differences between different sectors? For example, telecommunications being further ahead than financial services versus Absolutely. utilities versus, I don't know, local authorities or local governments or state governments or county counties, those, those sort of things. Absolutely. We, when we started out in Australia, we were focused on car park operations and payday lenders mm. and really like small ticket items because mm. collectors, they're happy to handle $5,000 accounts. That's a good commission for those companies. That's a, a good outcome. And when somebody owes $5,000, they're generally going to be probably more responsive to somebody that owes $60 mm. or $600 mm. where they may think, okay, I'll just deal with that when it gets to the worst part because I eventually mm. will be able to pay it. Some of the mentality of debtors is very interesting or consumers as we, we're now asked to call them in the, in the US. But I, I don't see the industry going back. I, I really see us going forward and as new communication tools come into play like WhatsApp, that's been a, a prevalent uh, request from many of our customers that hmm. how can we actually start engaging with customers on WhatsApp and we have some really cool chatbots around WhatsApp as well. So. Yeah, I, I suppose what's the blend between the feedback I'm always giving when I'm talking about digital collections is at some point you've got to talk with someone and you get people getting into vulnerable situations, you've got to actually, you've got to talk with someone. And what's the blend between 100% digital sort of automation or digital kind of collections versus having that kind of human touch and where do you think that sort of best sits in terms of where you draw the line and then how do you transition from one to the other as well yeah our product specifically does the transition really well so mm. we, we encourage people for the first 30 to 60 days to really scale out contact as many people digitally as you can see the response rates and then our system organizes that data mm. into who has been responsive the interaction that they've taken through the mobile optimized platform that we provide the debtors and our creditors or collection agents and small businesses can actually see that on their version of the arrears platform or their side. Mm. Um, and then they'll organize that. But what I mentioned earlier, it was 60 to 70% of the workflow was taken care of digitally, I think. And then you've got that mm. 40 to uh, 100% that you're going to have to actually interact with some people. And that's not necessarily because the digital side can't do it all. And there are many cases where debtors will receive a communication or a notice and they'll click on a link and they'll make a payment or they're into a payment plan or they'll dispute that mm. account or they may have already paid it. So they'll be able to upload and provide a copy of that receipt or, or, or of payment already. But there is circumstances and many where consumers will ignore. And that's when I think when the phone calls start, mm. it actually works two ways because as the phone calls start and you start saying, oh, collection agents calling, oh, I've got a link I can just deal with anyway. It prompts mm. people we notice after the 30 days when phone calls do start with some of our uh, mm. debtors or some of our clients' debtors that, that people will 
start being more receptive. But there are people that just are generally used to that. And and, that, and that's that older demographic that beyond the millennial demographic I was talking yeah. about where they may not trust a message. They may feel like, hey, there's another scam. And there are a lot of that. We all get 50 emails or a month from click this link or open this PDF. It's just once your email's public, it's incredible. <laughs> it happens. <laughs> it does, so. yeah. Yeah, it does. And that idea around almost like in the marketing world, they talk about priming, right? So you, you prime the message and you prime the message digitally. So then when actually do you, take, you do take action, be it the letter that goes out or be it the a telephone call, a telemarketing call that comes out, then they actually know something to go back with. How much do you think those ideas around, particularly around marketing, can translate into the collections world? How much of an opportunity do you think that is? Yeah, that was one of the themes at the ACA event, actually. They had a lot of around how they have these TikTokers and these Instagram mm. influencers that talk to you about how to get out of debt or how to manipulate and get a credit card and all these types of scammy types of approaches. And one of the things that was really focused on is that co the collections association is really saying, go out there and push your brand, show that you're trustworthy, show that you're here to help those consumers, show that you are digitalized, that you have all mm. the tools, that you're there in their face, but you're also there to help them because they mm. are a person. And I think that's a really good way to build a brand and to get yourself out there and maybe some trust. But essentially, a, a lot of these debtors are, are, are pr pr predominantly probably not mainstream. And when you're talking about collections in small credit card accounts, it's unlikely you're going to reach them through social media. But to mm -hmm. have your brand out there is still good. And I think one of the most important things is always being uh, Googleable. Mm -hmm. The ability to go on and say, hey, I got a link from careers.com. Let me check that out. Okay, that's a legitimate site. There's a log in customers. and you can see all stuff. Yeah. A bit of digital footprint is, I think, really important for a lot of co collection agencies that don't even have it. And one of the things that we leverage for them is a white label solution is actually providing them with that digital experience where they don't have to have their own website. And, yeah. and that's, you know, you get your small mum and dad debt collection shops that manage a couple of million dollars a year in collections. And they don't have the money to invest in enterprise technology. They don't have the money to build a website. And they've probably got a handful of small businesses they've worked with for 20 years. And that's what they do. Certainly keeping up with the, the number of communication channels is a real challenge, right? That's just, it's, 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 it's gone crazy, right? Everything from SMS and text messages. Now you mentioned WhatsApp, but then you do have things like it's all going into TikTok and Snapchat and all sorts of yeah. things. I mean, you just have to ask, but that's where, what do you think is going to come through? Where do you think the future is going to be on that? Well, um, one, of the th one of the things that we, we also witnessed at the ACA, and as I keep coming back to that, is just because in my mind, I'm visualizing all these different types of operations. One of them, which I thought was really interesting, was skip tracing through social media. So it mm. actually finds your social media profiles, collates all that data. You have websites like Rocket Reach. You can go on and put in somebody's mm. LinkedIn and get all of their information. How they do that, I'm not really sure. We do skip tracing through legitimate channels for our customers as they upload debts. They can elect mm. to skip trace. We thought the social media side was really interesting, and it's something we'll probably start to work into the platform in the years to come. But at, at today, I think that's going to be a really relevant product because some people do have prepaid cells that they jump in and out of. But one thing that people are most proud of is their social media profile. So if mm. you are Gen Z or a millennial and you're interacting with friends and family on social media, that's probably going to be the best place at all times to find them. And, and in the future, I think that's going to be more, more, more prevalent and more focused on as collectors really do adopt to an up and coming generation of digital consumers. Yeah. I mean, I said, say I took a little bit of a, a look at TikTok in terms of some of the videos out there were actually quite concerning in terms of either borrowing, borrowing you know, encouraging people to borrow with like probably less controls yeah. than you'd have on TV, like it used to be like 10 years ago, or debt advice that really wasn't strong enough. And there are a couple of good legitimate firms that are out there offering good kind of solutions. And it feels like there's a bit of a gap there. Maybe we need to do more as like responsible firms getting out there a little bit more with some of these newer platforms. Yeah. Credit licensing came into effect in Australia about four years ago. Credit licensing for debt collectors sorry so there was a, the Australian credit licensing regulators and then you mm. and now they have debt management regulators so to be a debt collector mm. you have to actually be licensed like mm -hmm. we we have licenses in multiple states that we're required to um, transact in and we only have those so we're regulated from that point of view but we don't actually mm. arrears doesn't do any collections itself we just have the ability to do so if we want to mm. under a regulated process so with all the current and up and coming communication portals and tools and apps, there are opportunities for us to be able to communicate with people in ways that 
we were never able to before. And basic SMS and email, it sounds simple to us, but mm. the delivery of those messages, the way that the message is scripted, it all has to be compliant. Regulation mm. F that came into effect in November 2022, yeah, that was a very helpful set of regulation that allowed digital collections operators and digital platform providers like us to really shape a compliant product. Mm. But at the same time, that's a segregated, that's a segregated regulation to the Fair, the Fair Debt Collections Practice Act. So some of the balance is really, if you're an operator doing a traditional, managing a traditional collections operation where you want to add digital, you really need to understand how the two regulations do work because they are separate. Yeah. And I just wonder how much the regulation itself actually drives digital adoption as well. So like the more regulation that seems to come in, what regulation seems to, it adds in additional controls, usually for the consumer. That usually adds in extra cost in terms of the collections process. And so and you end up having these burgeoning OPEX or cost curves, of which one way to manage that is basically by using digital to get further ahead, get earlier, those kind of things. And it feels like this is a symbiosis between actually regulation, strangely enough, and actually digital adoption, because it's, well, there's, there's two, two sides of the same coin. So we're also fighting communications providers. Hmm. Those communication providers have all banded together and built what's called the 10 DLC set of rules. And those set of rules actually restrict anybody in the debt collection industry from being a registered short code or a, or hmm. a, long, or, or a phone number with those providers providing debt collection reminders or notices. Hmm. So there are a lot of issues for collection agencies in an environment where there are really good players. There are people that are here to help Small businesses manage their accounts receivable, are here to help large organizations manage their account recoveries. And also you get those, there's an industry built around it. There's 7,000, there's more than 7,000 small business debt collectors in the United States. Mm. A small business debt collector is noted as a collection agency that manages less than $10 million in collections a year. We have customers that manage 3 to $4 million a year in there based out of California down the road. And that's just a couple of guys that have been in business together for 20 years. Mm. And that's what they do. They make mm. their money every year and they support the companies that they work for. And it's, it's crazy how these large organizations, like telcos, for example, cutting off debt collection from utilizing the SMS pipes. Mm. That's crazy. The reason they do that is they see it as high risk. And we have issues with payment providers. A lot of customers come to us and say, we can't do collect, we can't, take online payments or if we do mm. it's costing us eight percent because the mm. providers see it as opportunistic so we've partnered mm. with an infrastructure provider and a bank and we've created arrears pay and that allows mm. debt collectors to come in and you can either put that on your website or you can utilize it through the portal as part of your 99 dollar a month subscription we've tried to integrate all of these things that yeah. we see as issues we've got other communication channels like i mentioned whatsapp's not regulated whatsapp's direct 280 million people in Latin America have WhatsApp. America mm. has a very low adoption rate, whether mm. that's because of trust of Meta or what it is. Mm. We're not sure, we, we can't pinpoint one reason, but I think people trust iMessage over over Meta and mm. iMess is, a, is something we can cater to as well. Unfortunately, you know, as collections providers, we have to be able to cater for everything, don't we? Absolutely. It's for, for us, we're always looking, how are we going to be ahead of the technology curve? How are we going mm. to be ahead of the compliance that's yeah. chasing that technology curve? And then how can we have everything fully integrated so our customers have a seamless experience? We're not constantly shutting things off or having to advise them that something's not going to be working. We really do strive to ensure that we foresee some of these events coming up and especially things like the 10 DLC. We were ahead of that a couple of months ago, getting our customers yeah. all prepared. And some of them are approved because they aren't debt collectors, but others, we just have to provide them with a solution that allows them to directly contact iPhones for now. As you take a step back and that, particularly having come in, how much of an opportunity do you think there is in the US and where do you think that, and where do you think that kind of sits? What are the big gaps or the big things that need to be closed off, be it portals, be it messaging? What are the priorities you think that people got to look at? And how big is it? It's, it's the industry here. So, so we're focused on servicing small businesses. Small businesses mm. deal with last year, $825 million in late payments. A late payment mm. is seen as a payment that was 30 days after being 30 days overdue. So 60 days mm. overdue. Um, that doesn't include the money that the collection actions or the accounts that are sent off to collections. That's just small mm. business internal accounts at 60 days. Where we're focused for those guys is really providing them with a fully integrated platform where you can come along, you can 
sign up, you can start collecting from your own data, you can connect your API, your QuickBooks, your Zero, your Oracle, your Salesforce. There are a number of APIs that really just simplify getting that data in and then pushing mm. out messaging and scaling out collection actions. But I think where people are really missing the mark from other, as an industry, the gap in the market from where Arrear saw is the small businesses don't have access to enterprise grade, enterprise mm. grade technology. So those small businesses that are just managing there, there might be a tenant management company that manages real estate um, mm. portfolios. It could be just a small business that provides supplies to plumbers or individuals that do services jobs. Mm. Uh, we have law firms and accounting practices. We have debt collectors. We have a number of people. And the, the, the common issue for them is accounts receivable is not the focus of their company. Their company mm. is around growth. How do I mm. grow, sustain my business, pay my salaries, pay my office rent, pay my staff, pay my suppliers? It becomes like a, I guess for them, secondary to what's a priority in running a company. And so Aria sits there as an integrated platform that allows you to come in, sign up, upload your data, start collecting from your accounts receivable. And then if you do want to go into collections, we have a number of collectors that use the platform we can refer you to. So mm. it doesn't require all this mess, which is where small businesses that we, we're servicing are overwhelmed because they're not able to really foresee how they can manage a couple of million dollars in accounts mm. that are worth three, four, five, ten, twenty thousand dollars to them. That's a lot of different accounts. It's a lot of different people that they have to deal with, whether individuals or businesses. So the gap in the market that we saw and that we're, we're seeing that's getting worse and worse because large organizations are closing down that owe small businesses money. Mm. Small businesses are closing down that owe other small businesses money. Individuals are running away that owe small businesses money. Right now we're in a stage of the economy where people are a little uncertain. We don't, we do see people do come to us and they're worried about investing into technology or adding more to their overheads. Mm. But after they understand the product, the workflow, the cost saving and the time saving, they're really seeing that a platform that with one subscription does a job of five people in collections, yeah. they're really impressed and, and it, it does genuinely help those companies. And that's yeah. what we're here to do. And I suppose, how do you manage it between, and you mentioned there around B2B versus B2C as an example, right? So collections to, to collecting against businesses or small businesses versus, mm -hmm. versus against consumer, they can have slightly different dynamics, particularly as you get to like slightly larger businesses. Yeah. How do you think that the digital collections process changes between those two groups? It absolutely does. You look at business collections as managing an invoice. There's an outstanding mm. invoice of account, a product or a service delivered versus a consumer collections is there's a product or a service that has been delivered or consumed and the consumer hasn't paid for that. That could be just a telephone bill or it could be a power bill or it could be a, an iPhone payment that they haven't mm. made. Um, those consumers are expecting to engage with that, make a quick action. Their company, they have a process for payments. So they may mm. pay on the 14th of every month. So the communication is really based around a business style collections approach. So predominantly mm. email, predominantly addressed to accounts payable, predominantly uh, providing ACH type of mechanisms mm. that these companies are used to. Some mm. do pay on debit cards, but we see the majority of companies that um, are paying our customers utilizing ACH, which is good because the digital checks are, mm. are what people are used to. It's easier to record. It comes straight out of their bank account. It's a no brainer where consumers, they want to jump on and they want to go Apple pay, double click, mm. I've paid. Yeah. And that yeah. is a fast, no brainer, no thinking, take action in the moment. And a lot of debtors take action because they get the opportunity or they're sitting there at the time and they just, they know it's quick. And, and that's mm. what consumers expect versus businesses. Businesses mm. need time. They need to, especially when a small business is paying a small business, check on the cash flow. Can we pay salaries? Mm. If not, we mm. might have to put this out a week. That yeah. type of interaction is very prominent in the way that businesses deal with our customers yeah. and where consumers, they just look for quick double click on their Android or their iPhone yeah. or yeah. quickly put in the debit card and they're done.
And you talk a bit about, you're talking about the economy and the economy in the US. How would you characterize what you're seeing, at least from your clients? There's a lot of talk around the world falling apart, particularly during the pandemic. And it seems, feels like people saved, I think you mentioned earlier, and that people are starting to spend again. Where do you think we're going from here from a, an economic point of view? Because certainly in Europe, I haven't heard a lot around arrears really sticking up massively yet. Collections volume necessarily going through the roof yet, but people are certainly worried about it. And maybe the smirly signs in some sectors. Where do you think we, where do you think we go? What are you hearing? I, I, from our customer's point of view, what they're focused on is leaning out their businesses. Yeah. So where we're winning good, where we're, we're winning good clients or where clients have really been receptive to our product is it's a lean solution to hiring an operator or to mm. having multiple collectors to manage millions of dollars in accounts receivable. They're also, and the indication you've got, I think it was 700 and something companies have gone into chapter 11 in the US mm. this year versus 200 last year. Mm. You know, the, the numbers are there and you've seen, I hate to say this, but you're seeing the crime rates pushing a lot of companies out of business. Mm. You're seeing mm. the cost of finance where there's two differences in America. In America, they'll lend you off your balance sheet, they'll lend you off your cash flow and basically it's mm. You can go to a bank and say, look, and this is what I've earned for the last five years or two years or year. This is what I need to borrow. And this is how I'm going to ex mm. expand my business. They'll charge you a, a business loan rate and that rate will be variable after a couple of years. And now those rates, now those costs have gone up so much that a lot of businesses are just mm. focusing on repaying their debt mm. to their bank. Where in Australia and the UK, you can borrow, most small business lending is done against a property. Mm. So that's become interest it's an interest rate play from the, the commonwealth countries where america it's really just a survival play and mm. these companies are looking at how do i manage my cash flow how do mm. i ensure that my business can be sustained through the next 12 months through the next 24 mm. months because we've had this 12 and a half or 13 year rally in the markets it's mm. every seven to ten years we have a bubble burst that's mm. just the economics of the mm. market Something's keeping it going, whether that's productivity, whether that's whatever it is, cost of finance has gone up. And I think we haven't seen the full effect of that. Mm. And a lot of a lot of interest rates are being reset yeah. every quarter. And I think that there'll be a, a, a larger number of that towards the end of this year. And we may see some issues around. So, it, so it, kind of, it feels like people are managing the saving costs to try and manage further. Some of that's starting to bleed through, but it feels like that's the early start of the cycle maybe rather than yeah. I mean, rather look further at on. Office, so look at commercial real clouds. estate and office rent. Despite the work from home model, offices we're now building, hmm. I would say that probably people that I used to see every morning aren't here anymore. And yeah. those people were in general professional services companies or operations that serviced large organizations. So I've got two more questions. One thing we didn't talk about was AI. And I suppose a lot of noise has been made, particularly around large language models and yep. predict predictive text. So what do you think of that? And how do you think that's going to get wrapped into the collections process? Is it like greater personalization, et cetera? It's early days, I feel. Yeah. When we started out building arrears, one of the focuses was how do we use generative AI to build chatbots that humanize mm. the collection experience, both on a two-way communication flow. We have a chatbot that uses SMS and email and other digital channels. And what that chatbot really does, and, and I love to test it and say, can you order me a pizza? Because mm. a lot of AI is just an open AI wrap and you mm. can hack it and know that it's just that by asking mm. stupid questions and it mm. provides you an answer. Yeah. Um, there are off the shelf solutions with a very simple script you can add to your website for chatbots. And they're just, again, wraps. I think AI is going to be more and more prevalent, again, back to the digital focus. And this is where it all contributes to the next three to five years of, of us really seeing this nationally adopted across the 12 mm. and whatever thousand collection agencies in the United States is the AI side, whether that's AI voice bots, whether that's AI chatbots, whether that's data sorting, predictive modeling. There are a number of things that we're already using in our platform, especially from the predictive modeling and the chatbot side. Personalized messaging is really important. Mm. And I think that when you've got a debt book of 20,000 debtors and there's all these different variables across different accounts, ages, incomes, value of account, charge off dates, things like that, the generative AI is actually able to communicate with those debtors in a personalized way and generate a personalized mm. message. Hey, you, we your account was charged off with Chase where we're just here to help you get that sorted so you can keep your credibility and mm. 
may not affect your credit score or whatever else, but there's that side. And, and then I think there's the automation side and, and the automated mm. phone calls. We're seeing a few providers. And I think there was one that we met at the ACA skit.ai fantastic mm. product. And that's mm. that to me was very interesting, but the thing that I still have an issue with voice uh, bots is that they don't, they're not fast enough to respond. You can get mm. sort of three second delay people in two to three seconds. It's it, things change. We go one, two, mm. three, and we're waiting. It's what's going on here. So it needs to, there's a bit of catch up that will happen, but I think the LLMs and the generative AI is, is conversational AI is, is super important. One of the things that we've leveraged uh, GPT for is summarizers. So mm. in our platform, you can click on an account, you can summarize it and it basically reads the whole file and then says mm. to the collector, Trent owes $500. It was this date, the debt was entered into this date. He's been communicated to it three times. He uh, has responded to what, this message on this day at this time. The next mm. message, the next communication is scheduled for this time or conversely, uh, inversely, he's already made a payment. He's in a payment plan. And it just summarizes all the interaction. We like that because one of the issues we've found with a lot of our customers, especially the larger small businesses, mm. is that they have different files and different businesses owe them different money. And there may be that they'll have given terms on something in the past and taken a note, but nobody can find that note or it's too mm. far down the trails. Yeah, the AI is, is going to be everywhere. And as a pathway for small businesses, Arias provides a lot of um, practices in collections for that. And I think it gets mm. people used to that automation as well. And it's a super exciting next few years ahead. And, and yeah. what's coming out is we've got open AI and Google battling for who's got the best, the fastest servers and the GPUs. So it's, yeah. Yeah. All happening. It's going to be great. So, so, if we were going to come back in five years' time, let's say five years' time, where, yeah. where do you think the collections industry is going to be? Oh, the collection industry, from a digitalization point of view, is always mm. going to be progressing. I think it'll mm. move faster in the next three to five years. But in five years' time, I think if we were to have this conversation, you mm. and I would be talking about completely different technology. It could yeah. be anything from a a chip that sits here that visualizes the account that you need to pay, and you double click your ear. I don't know. It could be, <laughs> I'm not that Elon Musk type of forecaster where I'm going to shape the future. I'm just trying to shape a better experience for debtors so they can pay our customers more efficiently. But back to that, I, I think we're going to be having a conversation around the use of automation and credit risk profiling and how people pay things digitally. Digital currencies on the way, it's here. And yeah whether it's um, a government um, backed or whether it's a tech Crypto. founder built yeah. product, yeah. it's here and it's going to be more prevalent. And I think payment mechanisms are going to be a, 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 another focus in the near future as well. Yeah, yeah. Trent, thanks very much for, for making the time. It's, it's fascinating. It's great to hear how it's rolling out in the US in particular, and you know, some of the challenges there and some of the things you've learned from elsewhere as well in terms of like oh. definitely seeing an opportunity over there as well. It's it's super interesting just watching out this whole space in terms of how it's developing really. So well, thanks, thanks for your time, Chris. The fact you're doing this and championing the industry is great. Re massive amount of respect and thank you for having me on. No, you're quite welcome. Thanks very much.